Hi, everybody. So I'm Julie Pagano. I'm trying to make this so I can see it. OK. I'm talking to you today about speaker support of awesomeness. I'm here today to talk to you about supporting new speakers, specifically in kind of the tech community with a focus on technical conferences, but also some other things related to that. And this talk today is really for a couple groups of people. It's for new speakers or people who I can hopefully convince to become new speakers. And then for consumers of their talks. And what I mean by consumers are event organizers who want people to come speak at their events, attendees who spend their time and money to go to these events and presumably want to hear good talks, and then the people at home who watch recordings of the talks later. Today I'm going to cover three main topics. Why is it important that we support new speakers? How do we go about doing that? And tips and tricks for the new speakers to level up their first talk. Do we want me to wait a few minutes since there's like people trickling in? No, it's totally OK. I just am worried everybody's not going to know what I'm talking about. It's totally OK. Go ahead, come in and sit down. I won't be mad. <laughs> huh? Yeah, that's totally cool. All right, so I will repeat this slide since a bunch of new people came in. Don't, you don't have to apologize. It's totally OK. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm just letting people know what I'm doing. No, don't be shamed. This is a welcoming open space. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about three main things. Why should we go about supporting new speakers? What are some ways we can do that? And then some tips and tricks for new speakers to level up their first talk. So I want to start with the why. Why am I talking to you today? Why are we here? Why should we care as consumers? Because we want awesome talks. Awesome talks do things like expand your knowledge, challenge your preconceptions, and hopefully ultimately leave you feeling inspired. So what's not awesome? The same people giving the same talks on the same topics in the same way at the same conferences year after year after year. Even with really great speakers, this can start to get boring. I've heard all their jokes. I know all their stories. I've heard what they care about 100 times. Maybe I've literally seen them give this talk five times now. And even for the really great speakers who are able to keep it changeable, sometimes they want to take a break. Believe it or not, people have lives outside of conference speaking. They have families, hobbies, jobs. And when they take that break, we want to make sure that there's new speakers in the pipeline to follow behind them. And they're not all great speakers. Unfortunately, I'm sure we've all been there where it looked like a speaker didn't really put any effort into their talk or they went out and got so trashed the night before that they're hungover and their talk is terrible. And that's made me start to theorize there might be a speaker law of inertia. A person who speaks will continue to speak unless acted upon by an outside force. <laughs> and I want us to be that outside force because new speakers shake up the status quo. But in the status quo, it's homogenous. Homogenous is boring. Diversity is more interesting. Things like diversity of passions. Some of my favorite conference talks come from people who are passionate about what they're talking about. They're excited, they're clearly very knowledgeable, and they put a lot of effort into their talks, and it shows because they really care. It's my favorite talks. And when we're hearing from the same speakers year in and year out, we're hearing about the same passions over and over again. And when we get new speakers, we're going to get to hear about new passionate topics, and that's really great. We're also going to get a diversity of ideas. As we get new people, we're going to hear different things. Even on the old topics we've heard over and over again, we're going to hear different perspectives on those topics, different thoughts about them. We're also going to hear from a diversity of experiences. Somebody who's worked in industry for 20 years has a very different perspective from somebody who is just getting started as an apprentice. Somebody who works at a giant company has a different perspective than someone who works as a freelancer, et cetera, et cetera. Having these different experiences is really valuable for us learning and hearing different perspectives. There's also diversity of backgrounds. And this one can mean a couple different things. One of them is just a background different from the traditional I got a computer science degree. One of my favorite early speaker talks was from a woman named Nell Shamrell at uh, Madison Ruby a few years ago. I see Carrie shaking her head. She was at that conference. Uh, <laughs> you were at that conference. Um, and it was I think it was her first talk. If not, it was one of her first talks. And it was an amazing talk. And she was talking about her history as a theater major and working in theater with her current work as a software engineer. It was a really amazing talk. And that's a different background. That's not something you would get from a traditional conference speaker. 
Diversity of backgrounds can also mean the traditional demographic thing. Uh, things like gender, race, all these other areas. Unfortunately, the people who traditionally speak at our conferences do not match the demographics we are developing software for. And as a result, we can kind of miss out. So when we are able to hear from people who understand those demographics and the tech side of things, we can learn some really interesting stuff that's important for us to develop software. And let's not forget the elephant in the room, diversity of speaker lineups. I've provided a dramatization for this one. Any resemblance to real events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Vanilla Tech Conf is excited to announce the speaker lineup for 2014. Check out this sweet speaker lineup. We've got a lot of diversity here. We have a dude with a top hat and a monocle. This is the diversity. And so the internet gets a hold of this, and they say, we are disappointed in the homogenous speaker lineup. And the conference gets really upset, and they say, we tried, but we couldn't find any other speakers. And then the internet says, not good enough. And then everybody argues about it, and everybody's really sad. It doesn't have to be this way. Supporting new speakers can really help us avoid this problem because we've seen this happen a bunch of times. Part of the problem is legitimately that the pipeline of diverse speakers is pretty small. There's not actually that many of them. They're fairly underrepresented in the field in general. But part of the reason that happens is we're not providing a good support mechanism for new people to get involved in speaking. So that pool continues to stay small. If we were doing support, that pool would increase. The other side of it is a lot of these events and conferences provide no support for new people to get involved in their events. So even for the diverse groups that currently exist, they're never connecting with those conferences because that's not happening. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But don't worry, this isn't a unicorn talk. I promise I will not spend the whole time talking about diversity. So let's move on to why you should become a speaker. Because public speaking is good for you, and I said so. Now as an exception to this, there are some people for health reasons, personal reasons, Public speaking is not a good fit for them. Please do not harass people into public speaking if they tell you they don't want to do it. But for the rest of you, if you're even a teeny bit interested, I think you should give it a try. It really helps with improving confidence. Public speaking is hard. It legitimately is difficult for most people. And so when you're able to accomplish something difficult, that can really help with your confidence. And then you usually get helpful feedback about it, a lot of times positive. People telling you you did a good job can boost your confidence. And after speaking in front of hundreds of strangers, a lot of other things seem way less scary. I'll tell you a secret. Before I started public speaking, I was incredibly passive and quiet. One of my old coworkers at a conference last year introduced me saying, I used to know Julie when she was Julie. And this was because it was very quiet. And I started public speaking. And as I did that, it actually really helped me with my confidence in engaging with people generally. Raising my hand at work seemed way less scary after I had to speak in front of 300 strangers. Asking a question, speaking up with my teammates, all of these things seem way less scary. I, it basically reset my level for what's terrifying as far as interpersonal interactions. Public speaking gives you a chance to promote your ideas. Do you have a new open source project that you want people to contribute to or start using? Do you have a new technique for solving a problem? Do you have a topic that's really important to you, like imposter syndrome? I talked about that earlier. Uh, these are ways to promote those ideas, because you're going to get an audience who listens to you talk. And if you do a really good job, they're going to leave feeling inspired. They're going to leave that conference, and they're going to go talk to other people about what they heard. They're going to evangelize your ideas for you if you do a good job. And then not only that, most places record your talks. So they'll also go online, and you get a whole new audience there. And then those people, if they really like it, are going to repeat it. They're going to tell other people about it. This can be exposure that you can't pay for of being able to share your ideas. Speaking at conferences also allows you to promote yourself. We don't like to talk about this, but who you know can be just as important as what you know. Uh, when you want people to listen to you when you promote a new idea, when you want people to believe you when you say it's valuable to contribute to your project, when you're looking for a new job, who knows you and who you know can really help with that. And when you do public speaking, people start to know who you are. They recognize your name and your face, the ideas that you've been presenting on stage, and you become more well known, and that can be really helpful for your career and for your involvement. Speaking also gives you a chance to meet awesome people. I can't speak for anybody else, but for me personally, going to a conference and not being a speaker is actually really stressful. I have to walk up to strangers and be like, would you like to be my friend? 
will you talk to me? If, at least that's in my head how it feels. And when I'm a speaker, I don't have to do that. People want to come up and talk to me. They're excited to talk to me about my ideas because I just presented them on stage. So it's kind of a trick for social anxiety in some ways. And I've heard other people say this as well. Another reason this is useful is be the change you want to see. One of the reasons I started public speaking is when I started going to conferences four or five years ago, there were very few women speakers. And as a woman who was just getting started in my career, that was really frustrating to me. There was nobody like me I could look up to. And for a while, I just kind of whined about it on the internet. I'm really good at that. But I realized that it was possible for me to help fix this problem. I was at least one woman, and I had thoughts and things I could share. And so I thought, I'll at least give it a try. And I think that it's really helped in that. Somebody tweeted during my keynote on Tuesday saying, this is the first keynote I've seen where the speaker looked like me. And that was like really warmed my heart because that is one of the reasons I started public speaking. So this may appeal to you, may not, but this is one of the reasons that you could try. Now before you start looking for excuses, because I know that at least some of you are about how to get out of this, I want to cover some of those as well. A big one I hear is that I'm not a big name. So how could I speak? I want to clarify this is not required. Otherwise we would get this chicken and the egg problem because a lot of people become big names because they do public speaking. So if you have to be a big name to do the public speaking, you can see where the problem happens. So this isn't needed for conferences that select their talks via something called a CFP. A CFP is a call for proposals. And talks at these conferences are selected by writing up a proposal saying, this is what I want to talk about. This is why it's useful for your conference. I think you should accept this. And those conferences mostly select based on the quality of the proposal, not on who you are. Uh, Open Source Bridge is one of those conferences. They selected talks based on proposals. This is pretty common. And so this can be a really good way to get involved if you're new. Another one I hear is, I'm not an expert. And this can be valid. But a lot of people overblow what they need to be an expert on. What they think they need to know is basically the entire world around the topic they're talking about. The reality is you're going to talk for 30 minutes, maybe an hour. You are not going to cover the world of any topic in computer programming in 30 minutes to an hour. You're just not. And so what you actually need to know are the topics you're focusing on and some tangentially related topics that are important and relevant. It's OK if somebody comes up to you after your talk and asks you kind of a vaguely related question, and you say, I'm sorry, I don't know. Like That's totally OK. That is a valid answer. Very few speakers know everything about the topic they're talking about. I know I certainly don't. And you are an expert on your experiences. Some of my favorite talks are about people talking about, my team used this language or this library to solve this problem for a client or for our team. And these are the problems we had. And this is what we ended up doing. And this is what we learned. Or we failed horribly. And it was a disaster. But it's funny. And let's talk about it. Those are my favorite, some of my favorite talks. And you don't have to be an expert on the library, the language you used, or even the problem space. You need to be an expert on what experience you went through. And if you went through that experience, you are, in fact, an expert on it. And experts aren't always the best people for the job. Experts are all the way over here. But some of the conference talks are for beginners, which are all the way over here. An intro to a language or a library, a how-to, a tips and tricks. And the problem with having an expert give these talks is although they know a lot, they're so far separated from being a beginner that they don't remember what it's like. And so they often have difficulty presenting the material in an accessible way. An intermediary actually is often better for this job. They know enough of the material to present really well to a beginner, and they remember what it's like to be a beginner. And so they can present it in a way that works better for beginners. Another one I hear is, I don't have anything interesting to say. And my response to that one is usually, this is my skeptical face. <laughs> now, I'm sure some of you are really boring. But for most of you, I think this is actually the imposter syndrome talking. This is an area where you need a little help. And I'm going to talk about how you can get that a little bit later. And the last one I hear is, I'm afraid of public speaking. This one, completely valid. But I want to tell you a secret. Almost everyone is afraid of public speaking. Almost everyone. Also, did I just make the mic not work by making my cute hand gesture? OK. Um, I'm actually curious, straw poll, who in the room finds public speaking scary, uncomfortable, awkward, anxiety inducing? Look around. It's like everybody in the room. And some of the people in this room speak a lot. 
Like, I don't mean to pick on Carrie, but I know she speaks a lot. Uh, I've spoken to, um, for about two years now. So it's really common. Some of the best speakers are still afraid of doing it. This does not preclude you from public speaking. There's all these benefits and values you get from public speaking that can make it worth dealing with that anxiety. And the other thing that's important to note is it does get a little bit better. When I first started public speaking, I was like anxiety attack level afraid of it. I wouldn't eat for the entire day before I spoke because I was afraid of throwing up. That's how afraid I would be. And I feel much better now. Slowly and surely, every time I spoke, it got a teeny, teeny bit easier. And I still get anxious and I still get worried about it, but it's much more manageable now than it was two years ago when I started. So I think it's worthwhile for you to at least try speaking once or twice. If you really, really hate it, you don't have to keep doing it. I promise, I will not force you. But you may find that you're like me and you get a taste for it and it's worth dealing with that anxiety. So let's move on to the how. How are we gonna actually support new speakers? We need to have people both giving and getting support actively. People who want to speak need to raise their hand and say, I am interested in speaking. I need help. Please help me. And people who are willing to provide that help also need to make themselves available. They need to say, I am available to give help to new speakers. I am here. Part of the problem is these groups are kind of sitting in isolation quietly, hoping somebody is going to come to them. And that's just not going to happen. These groups need to be actively trying to find each other. So let's start with our event organizers. This is really important to you as event organizers. You need speakers for your events. You need to have them. Unfortunately, a lot of conferences take a field of dreams approach to their call for speakers. They say, if you build it, they will come. They just set up a CFP, maybe tweet once about it, and then they're like, where are all the speakers? You need to, this just doesn't work. You need to be able to do active outreach and particularly support. If all you do is tweet a little bit, or maybe mention it on a local mailing list, you're gonna reach your network, which are probably gonna be people who look like you. You're gonna end up with a conference like the one I joked about earlier, because you're, especially if the conference organizers are from that homogenous group, because many of their friends are going to look like them. So you need to do better active outreach. You can connect with a bunch of different communities. You need to talk to user groups in other locations. Don't just reach out to your local community. That's really limiting. And you also need to provide support. Help answer questions for people about what you're looking for at your conference. Make sure your CFP shares that information. All sorts of things like that. And I want to provide an example of a conference that's been doing a really good job of this, uh, PyCon. I went to PyCon for the first time this year. I was a speaker. and. I want to note that this year they had a third women speakers and they had a third women attendees. And I don't think those numbers being close to each other is a coincidence. Uh, and they didn't do this by filling quotas. That's really important because I think that's the wrong way to go about it. They did this by actively doing outreach. They contacted tons of people and said, we want you to speak at PyCon. We would love to have you submit to our, our call for proposals. We are interested in what you have to say. Not only did they reach out to people and ask them to submit, but they, many people offered to help people with their proposals. Because for first time speakers, they often don't know how to put a good proposal together. They have great ideas, but they don't know how to present it in just the right way. So some help can be really great. And as a result, they had a really amazing conference this year. I want to admit that some, my favorite talk was from a woman named Julie, I think Lavoie is how you pronounce her last name? Lavoie, thank you. Uh, and she gave a talk about analyzing uh, rap lyrics with Python, and she admitted that the reason she was there was Jessica McKellar, who's part of the organizer committee, reached out to her and said, I want you to submit a talk to PyCon, and then she also helped Julie with her proposal. And if, without that, Julie would not have spoken, and that was my favorite talk at the conference, and it was a really big favorite. I think her video on YouTube has like 5,000 hits now. So it's, it was one of the best talks, and it got there through this outreach process. In this tweet from Jessica, she says, hello from your PyCon diversity outreach chair. Percentage of PyCon talks by women, in 2011 it was 1%, the next year 7, the next year 15, this year 33. Outreach works. And this is important to note, that this will not fix overnight for you, but 
You do this year after year, and you can see really good progressive improvement of your conference. And it's notable that her role was their diversity outreach chair. They had a person who her entire job was to do outreach, that this was important to them, and they were willing to put effort into it. And it showed at the conference this year. It was a great conference. It was really well received. It, I think it was completely sold out. Like, people really wanted to be there. So this is an example you can follow on. Now, for the experienced speakers, I really want to call on you to pay it forward. You want to encourage other speakers to follow after you. If for no other reason than selfishness, you also attend conferences. You want the other talks to be good. And one day you want to take a break. Because again, you have family, friends, hobbies, children. Like You have reasons you want to take a break. And you want to make sure that you don't leave people in the cold. You want to make sure you're fostering people to follow behind you. So there's a couple different things you can do. A really simple one is planting the seed. Just telling people that you want to hear them speak and that they can. Believe it or not, a lot of people don't get told this, that you have interesting things to say and I want to hear you share them. Uh, for me, this happened when the DevChicks Google group was starting to have speaker support hangouts. And I was like, I maybe want to speak, but I'm not sure, so I'll join and find out what it's about. And I had a really great conversation with Sandy Metz and Chuki Chan, and they said to me, I want to hear you speak. I think it's important. It's valuable. We want to help you. And they let me talk through a few of my ideas, offered to help me in the future if I needed it. And then I kind of chickened out and took like a year. But I would have never decided to speak without having talked to them. It took me time to kind of key myself up for it, but they helped me get started and believe I could. And so that's really important. You can do that for others. It's just a few words of encouragement. It's not that much work. You can also provide advice. You could write blog posts. You can give a talk about talking, like I'm doing right now. Uh, you can mentor. You could find a few people in your local community that you know online, and you could work with them individually. Or you could start a support group. And this is what I did, so I'm going to expand on that a little bit. I run a support group called the Tech Comp Speaker Support of Awesomeness. It's, very, it's a very silly name, I know. Uh, and our group was originally created because myself and a bunch of my friends wanted to learn how to speak, and we had no idea what we were doing, and we wanted to get help. And so we were all over the country. Uh, I think some, we have some members who are uh, all over the world now. And we decided we'd get together using a Google group to email each other, and then Google Hangouts so we could meet in person-ish. Uh, and we started hanging out once a month, roughly. And we've added new people over the last year. And this has been really great. We help people with all different parts of the process. And we have had a bunch of members of our group as speakers. We have at least one member of the group in the room, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. I'm going to keep picking on Carrie. I'm sorry. Um, and it's been a really great group. We've had dozens of speakers, and it's awesome. So I'm going to walk through with you some of the things that our group does and helps with so that maybe you can consider adopting like this for your own group. So one of the things we start out with is brainstorming. Remember how I said people don't know they have something interesting to say? This is where we fix that. We will sit down and chat with people. We'll talk with them about what are you excited about? What are you passionate about? What do you do at your job? What open source projects do you contribute to? What ideas are important to you? And we'll kind of help them suss out ideas that would be good for a conference talk, that we think would be interesting to people, and hopefully they leave this with two or three ideas that they think would be good for a talk. From there, we help them select events. We need, now that you have ideas, you have to find events that are a good fit for those ideas. It doesn't matter if you have an idea if you can't find an audience for it. So we have enough experienced people in the group that we're able to think about conferences we know about. Either we know the organizers, we've attended before, and we start to look at, OK, what events are a good fit for this talk? Which ones have an audience that's a good fit for the idea you want to present? Which ones are geographically reasonable for you, timeline-wise? Which ones have support financially if you can't afford to send yourself? Which ones have open CFPs? All these kinds of questions. We help people curate a list of events that might be a good fit for them. From there, we help with proposal writing. For new speakers, this is one of the critical pieces. This is how you get accepted to that first talk. It's kind of like a resume for your first job. It might be the thing that gets you in. And as a result, a lot of effort should be put into this. A lot of people make the mistake of kind of half-assing their proposals, and that's often a mistake. Things like a grammar mistake, spelling mistakes, misunderstood information can mean your talk doesn't get accepted. 
Having somebody help you can help you avoid that and have your talk get accepted. I still do this even as a maybe intermediate, intermediate level speaker. My friend Tef helped me with this proposal for the talk I'm giving you right now. And my first run in it was pretty boring. It was a really mediocre proposal. And he helped me kind of level it up to a talk that was actually accepted. This is always a good thing for people to get help with, even really experienced speakers. Having another person read it and give you advice, always a good idea. Another thing our group helps with is expectations management. This is really important for new speakers. Without good expectations management, people can be crestfallen by what happens because they don't understand. My advice from my friend Jake the dog is sucking at something is the first step to being sort of good at something. And I think this totally applies to public speaking, especially if you're afraid of it. So we really try to help with that. One of the important pieces of expectations management is proposals. Proposals get rejected. This is normal. But if you don't know this, that rejection feels terrible. It can totally destroy somebody's morale. They think that, oh, I just can't be a speaker. I have to quit. I'll never try again. Talks get rejected all the time. I was an organizer of a conference last year, and I was in charge of the CFP process. And we had six slots open, and we got over 100 proposals. Just think of the numbers there. We had to reject tons of really great talks. Not because there was anything wrong with them, because we only had six slots. So it's really important for people to understand that rejection is actually pretty normal. Doesn't mean you shouldn't ask for advice. Could you give me feedback on what wasn't good about my proposal? But a lot of times the answer is your proposal was great, we just only had so many slots. Try again next year. And that's OK. That's why a lot of us submit to many conferences, knowing that our talk's going to get rejected at many of them and only accepted at a few. This has always been my approach, especially when I was new. My expectation was, I'll submit to a dozen conferences. Maybe it'll get accepted at one, and that's OK. So under setting that expectation of failure can make it less painful for people. The other piece is expectations about your first conference talk. If you go into your first conference talk thinking that you are going to give the world's most amazing TED talk, and the video online is going to have a million hits, you're going to be really sad when that doesn't happen. Because you don't go from zero to being amazing overnight. It takes time. It takes practice. My goal the first time I gave a conference talk was, I will give my entire talk, and I will not throw up on anyone. That was my goal. It's a very low bar, I know, but I was really afraid of speaking. But as a result, I felt good afterwards. I gave my whole talk, and nobody got puked on. It was great. And then from there, I certainly set higher goals for myself. Um, but you should set, we can help people set reasonable goals when they get started. If you set your goals too high, you just set yourself up for disappointment, and that really sucks. Another thing we help with is talk preparation. Once people get their proposal accepted, that's where all the hard work actually starts. We help people with outlining, putting together slides, and then often people actually want to practice their talk. We'll often set aside a half hour in our meeting for people to sit on the Google Hangout and actually give us their talk. And this allows them to practice in front of a friendly audience, to get feedback on their slides and their content, and really improve their talk before they give it to a real audience. This is really useful. And lastly, we provide kind of generalized support for each other. It's really a group of friends who are supporting each other in speaking. So sometimes it's just a kind word when a talk gets rejected and they're sad about it. Or we know somebody's going to speak the next day and we send them friendly tweets and say, you're going to do a great job, you're awesome. Or they've just finished a talk and we see all the happiness on Twitter about their talk. And we say, you did a great job, you're awesome. It seems small, but especially for new speakers, really great to give them that kind of support, which they may not be getting elsewhere. So what about for individuals? How can you help yourself get started? A really important thing is starting small. This ties in with that expectations management thing. Especially if you're afraid of public speaking, you want to set your site small to start so you can gently push your boundaries on this stuff. You don't want to put yourself in front of a thousand people the first time you speak, because that's terrifying. So a really good starting place is something called lightning talks. And lightning talks are usually about five minutes long. Sometimes they're a little shorter, sometimes they're a little longer, but the average is about five minutes. And these are usually really easy to sign up for. A lot of conferences have them, and you just put your name on a board. There's no, you just have to volunteer. Uh, a lot of local user groups do these. Sometimes there's some online hangouts that do them. And they're only five minutes long, which means they're easy to prepare for. It's not a lot of work. And if you're afraid of public speaking, it's only five minutes long. It's not that long. And the really good thing about this is 
the worst case scenario, not that bad. If you give a really bad lightning talk, generally nobody remembers because it's only five minutes long and the next person goes on and it's fine. So in that case, you got to practice for talking for five minutes, you accomplished a goal. Nobody's gonna be mad at you. If you do a really great job, the positives are really overwhelming. Uh, I still get feedback from people about a lightning talk I gave a few years ago. People still talk about Gary Barnhart's Watt talk about JavaScript. They love that talk, it was a lightning talk. So again, they're only five minutes long, a really good starting place for new speakers. Some other places to start small can be speaking at work. A lot of us are obligated to do it anyway, so you might as well get something out of it while you're being forced to do it. Another one is user groups. Local events for a language or a topic that you care about. It's a smaller audience. They're often really desperate for speakers, and they're usually a little friendlier than a, a conference audience. I started doing lightning talks at Pittsburgh uh, Ruby when I was first public speaking. Another really good group is a group called Toastmasters International. And Toastmasters is not tech related at all, but it is related to public speaking. And I find that the public speaking is the part that actually really scares people. And so this is a group that's just dedicated to helping you with public speaking. So they're not gonna be judgy about it. They're gonna be really supportive. They have tools to help you. And this is a great place to kind of do this in that nice friendly environment to work on the public speaking part. And they have over 14,000 clubs in over 100 countries, which means there probably is one where you live. There's like a pretty good chance. So I want to move on to some tips and tricks. For those of you in the room who maybe want to start public speaking, does anybody maybe want to start public speaking? Can I get a raise of hands? A few? You don't have to. It's OK. Uh, so I have some tips and tricks for when you're ready, things that can help you level up that first talk to really make it a little better. And surprisingly, these are things that I see even some experienced speakers not doing. So when you do them as a beginner, it can really make your talk shine in a way that it wouldn't otherwise. Now, I do want to keep in mind, these are, your mileage may vary on these, not all of them work for everyone, but hopefully at least some of these are helpful. So I'm going to start with some don'ts, because what you shouldn't do can be just as important as what you should do, so we'll start with those first. Don't alienate your audience. This seems really obvious, but unfortunately it happens every year. There's somebody who alienates an audience at a conference, it happens more commonly than you think. This is really bad because no matter how awesome the rest of your talk is, if you alienate your audience, people take out their phones and they read their email or Twitter and you've lost them. It doesn't matter how good your talk is, they're done, they're gone. And so you really wanna avoid this if you can. So I did kind of a poll online to ask people what sort of things alienate them and one thing came up over and over again and it was this, so easy your mom can do it. People hate this. It's incredibly cliche, and it's kind of demeaning to a lot of people. A lot of people's moms are computer scientists, and they know how to use computers better than the speaker does. So be really careful about using this one. In fact, honestly, I think you should throw it out. It alienates people. It's never useful. Find another thing to say. The other way to avoid alienating people is remembering that your conference talk is not open mic night at the local comedy club. Now, this doesn't mean you can't be funny, but keep in mind that a conference is a professional venue, and it's not a comedy club. If it's a joke that wouldn't be appropriate at work, you probably shouldn't tell it. And a lot of people kind of use this as a way to get around the fact that they're afraid of speaking. They think kind of using cheap jokes will make them feel better, but it often backfires and it upsets the audience. This is also often the case that leads to code of conduct violations. And if you violate the code of conduct by telling a really bad joke, you often upset the organizers because they have to deal with that as well. And so this is a really bad mistake to make as a first time speaker. I recommend being careful about your jokes and actually like trying them on some people first. Make sure they work. Be careful about that. And if you're not funny, don't force yourself. You can, tell, you can do a good talk without being humorous. It's not required. So another don't. Don't live code. And this is specifically for beginners. Live coding is an advanced skill. And the reason I discourage you from doing this is there are about a thousand different ways live coding can go wrong. And if you're really nervous about speaking already, you don't wanna to have to worry about a thousand points of failure. You just don't. I've seen it happen and it's really a discouraging for the speaker. It's really weird for the audience and it just doesn't work out well. All of the cases where I've seen live coding go well, it was a very experienced speaker who was kind of beyond that point where they were very afraid of speaking, and they'd practice. I asked one of them, how do you do so well at live coding? And he said, I have practiced it 100 times. 
And I don't think he was kidding. I think he literally practiced 100 times. And so this is one you should avoid if you can. The one exception to this I've seen that worked really well is the speaker actually did his live coding ahead of time and recorded it, kind of like a screencast. And then he played the video and spoke over it while he did his talk. And so it kind of looked like he was live coding, but it removed all those points of failure because he did it right when he wasn't under stress. He did it you know, kind of on his own. And so that was much better for him. That's a good way to kind of end run this rule. Another one is don't read us your blog post. And what I mean by this one is that a blog post and a presentation are two very different mediums, and they don't really lend well to each other. Imagine somebody holding up a blog post and reading it to you for 45 minutes. Really, really boring. And the same thing kind of comes through when somebody sits and reads their speaker notes for 45 minutes. It can be really boring. And so this takes me to some of the things you should do. Slides. One of the really important things is how you think about slides. Slides should be a prop or a backdrop for your talk. They should not be the main event. If your talks are really busy and they like have every word of your talk on them and people can just take your slides and reproduce your talk, why are they coming to your talk? They could just go read the slides. And so you really want to think of them as a supporting tool, not the main event. And as a result, you should keep them simple. If you make them really complicated, the audience gets distracted. They are reading your slides instead of listening to what you have to say. And keeping them simple also allows you to make sure that your slides are not an eye chart. You want to make sure that people can actually read your slides. And so you shouldn't use tiny text. You should use big text, huge text, ridiculously massive text, so that the people in the back of the audience can see this. This is especially important with a big audience where the room is quite large. And this brings me to code on slides. This is a place where a lot of people make mistakes about this. They try to put their entire program up there, and then nobody can read it. Can anybody actually read this? Maybe a little bit? Um, but not very well. And so this is very hard for the audience. What you should actually do is break out into a block of code or a function that you're going to focus on. Another piece of this is syntax highlighting. Syntax highlighting is really, really great when you're actually doing coding. But for an audience, it can actually be distracting. There's colors all over the place. Where should we focus? So I actually recommend making most of the text kind of a neutral color like black, and then using colors and bolding to help them focus on the part of the code you're actually talking about. Using comments can also be a good way to annotate the code you're talking about as you go through it. And then suddenly you can have colors and comments to kind of help the audience follow along as you're talking about your code. Because attention spans aren't great, and if you make them just read a giant block of code, they, they get lost. You need to help them. And then when you get to your next function, you put up your next block of code. And again, you can use colors to help them walk through it. This can really make watching code on slides very manageable and followable instead of something that just kind of puts the audience to sleep. Really important. Another important thing about content, don't put important content at the bottom of your slides. At a lot of larger venues, there's going to be people's heads in the way unless you're in the first few rows. And you generally won't know about this ahead of time. And if you put content down there, people can't see it. Now, I think everybody in the room can see my slides, so you can see my little joke in there. <laughs> but you want to plan for this ahead of time because you generally don't know. Another important thing about slides is using high contrast between the color of your text and your background. Because what your code and your content looks like on your computer screen is not what it looks like on a projector. These projectors are actually pretty nice. But at a lot of venues, if the rooms are really sunny or the projectors are old, the content is often very washed out. So that something like this which is sort of readable here. On a lot of projectors, this will actually be unreadable. It's gray on black. And so you want to be careful about that. There's also the colorblindness case. If you use red and green or some other color choices, there will be people in your audience who can't read them because of colorblindness. And colorblindness is very common. I think it's 8% for red-green colorblindness. And so you should just avoid this entirely. Think about accessibility. And this looks really ugly anyway. It looks like Christmas. It's terrible. This one's all, are you ready? Oh, thank you. Um, this is also really important for doing things like charts and graphs. We love to use green for good and red for bad, but with the wrong labeling, this is impossible to understand what it looks like. This is what it might vaguely appear, it would be similar to this for somebody with red, green color blindness. Which part's good, which part's bad, who knows? So you want to be really thoughtful about this and make sure you use some annotation that makes it clearer. Another thing that's really important is supporting imagery. 
A lot of people are visual learners and attention spans aren't great, especially for long talks. Imagery can help them connect with what you're talking about and remember it better later. Now you may be saying to yourselves, but Julie, I am not a designer. Where am I gonna get this imagery from? I'm glad you asked. I get my, most of mine from a site called The Noun Project, which their little tagline is creating, sharing, and celebrating the world's visual language. And you go there and you search for a term and they will have cute little vector images to go with it. And because they're vector images, you can resize them, recolor them to match your slides. And they've got like everything. They have cat cuddling. They have Sharknado. And if they have Sharknado, they probably have whatever you need for your talk. And the great thing is most of their stuff is Creative Commons by attribution, which means that you can use it for free as long as you remember to provide attribution to the creator. I normally put an attribution slide at the end of my uh, slide deck so that people can go through those if they want them. Another site you can get Creative Commons content is Flickr. You can do a Creative Commons search and find photography that might look nice in your slides. I don't do this one personally, but it's very popular with a lot of other speakers. Another thing people like to do for imagery is pop culture. This one can be really cute. This can be a good way to insert jokes that are pretty non-upsetting to people, shared pop culture knowledge and everything. But some people go a little overboard. They get really excited, and they're just putting all the memes in there. And suddenly it's bees, everywhere bees. And the audience just really can't take this. And I've seen this happen before. Some people go overboard, and their talk ends up being like 80% funny memes, 20% content. And that's a really bad signal to noise ratio. So I recommend using these sparingly, sometimes to break up tension in your talk or to get a cute laugh here and there, but don't like fill your entire talk with memes. It's a little too much. So I wanna give you the most important piece of advice that you can get for preparing for your first talk, and that's practice. I know this is not exciting. I know this is not the silver bullet that you were hoping for, but the reality is practicing actually really helps. Uh, and then practicing some more, and then practicing again. Uh, I've, I've gotten good feedback on some of my talks, especially the one I did for the keynote, and I'll tell you the secret. I put like 80 hours of preparation into that talk. Uh, a, a lot of that was practice. Certainly not all of it was. A lot of it was interviews. But practicing really can help. And I'm gonna share you, with you my secret preparing method. I refer to mine as the Reservoir Dogs method, which makes sense to nobody because I'm old and nobody has seen this movie apparently. Uh, but I'm going to explain. So one of the characters in the film Reservoir Dogs has to memorize a humorous anecdote. And he has to be able to tell it like it is a real story that he lived through. He can't read a script, just like I can't read you my blog post. And it was really important that he memorized it. His life depended on it. So the character that's helping him says, memorize what's important, the rest you make your own. And that's what I do. I do not use speaker notes personally. My speaker notes are my slides. Those are the important points. Each of my slides, it's why I have like 150 slides for a 45 minute talk, uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, my slides are the important points and the rest I make my own. And the character explains, the only way to do that is to keep saying it and saying it and saying it. And in the film, you see the character reading the script and saying it on his own and saying it over and over again until he's finally saying it for real and it sounds like he's telling a real story. And this is how I try to prepare for my talks. I practice it over and over and over again to the point where I know the story really well, but I haven't memorized it. Every time I give my talks, it's a little different. There are people in the room who've seen my imposter syndrome talk before. They'll say it was different this time than last time. And that's how I go about this. It works really well for me getting over my anxiety about speaking, but means I don't memorize and it doesn't sound like I'm a robot reading you my talk. Uh, so this may work for you, it may not, but in general, I find practicing is very valuable. Most of the really great speakers I know sound like it's natural, but the reality is that comes from them practicing their talk many times. Very few people actually are natural, awesome speakers who can speak off the cuff like that. Another important thing is playtesting your talk. And what I mean by this is practicing your talk in front of a real audience. This is the schedule I used for playtesting this talk. I did it about a week in advance. And that's really important because it gives you a false deadline to force yourself to finish your talk early. And you're gonna talk to these people. You're gonna see when they laugh at your jokes or if there's dead silence and maybe you should take that joke out. They're going to give you feedback, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, where they were confused, what they wish you expanded on. And now you have a week to include that feedback in your talk. And this can take kind of a mediocre talk into an awesome talk because you gave yourself a week to really include that feedback. Lastly, plan for technical difficulties. They will happen. 
And especially as a new speaker, this will be anxiety inducing for you if you don't plan for them ahead of time. Make sure you have slides elsewhere. Make sure you plan for the Wi-Fi not to work. The Wi-Fi never works. It actually works at this conference, but usually it never works. So plan for this. And so I'm pretty much out of time. So become a speaker. I would really love to see you becoming a new speaker. At least consider giving it a try. And for the rest of you, please support new speakers. Uh, I think it's really important. And thank you. Also, I want to note my slides are online. And I had a ton of content I couldn't fit in this. So I just like threw it at the end of the slides. So there's like blog posts, talks about talking, some notes about presentation tools, more stuff about PyCon, other conferences. Uh, like a whole bunch of crap in here that basically may be interesting to you. Um, so if you're interested, you can totally do that. Uh, and the speaker support group I do is online. I have limited openings for some new people. So if you're interested and you email me uh, and you're new, I would totally be interested in having you join our group. Um, so feel free to contact me about that. And I will put the slides on the notes on the wiki thing. Um, I don't think I actually have time for questions. I'm pretty much out of time, right? Yeah. Uh, I would happily talk to people during the open spaces on Friday, though, or like in the hallway after or whatever. I'm going to go down to the hacker space if you want to ask me questions. Um, what was your first today? Yes. You did a good job. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, like I have my speaking timeline up there. Yeah, I have my timeline in there as well in case you want to feel better about how, how, how you can progress. I have a timeline of when I started speaking, and that was totally my first keynote. Uh,